thank you everybody for uh, still being here at this late hour. Um, yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here and a great honor indeed. And um, yeah, as Jean Daniel already said, so on the one hand, this talk um, connects to sort of the general theme of, of computational or combinatorial topology, um, but maybe from a rather different perspective than what we've seen uh, in Constantine's talk. So the, the motivation is less directly applications in other sciences, but rather, if you will, on the one hand, applications or notions within, within mathematics, and on the other hand, um, something that one could call uh, the creation of mathematical infrastructure. But let me start with something that is hopefully very familiar and definitely very classical, which is graph planarity, uh, where the most classical question is, given a graph, a network, can we draw it in the plane uh, without any self-intersections, without any crossings? Um, this is a question that we understand very well. We have beautiful characterizations, such as Kowatowski's criterion that says that a graph is planar if and only if it does not contain either of two minimal non-planar subgraphs as a, or it does not contain a subdivision of one of two minimal non-planar subgraphs, the complete graph on five vertices and the complete bipartite graph on two classes of three vertices, which you see here on the right. Um, there are other, like there, I mean, it's such a classical topic, I don't even know where to begin. Um, another very classical and maybe slightly less well-known criterion for planarity that will be a bit more connected to the spirit of the talk is the Hananitat theorem, which says that a graph is planar if and only if you can draw it in the plane in a way that maybe still has crossings in it, but the crossings follow a particular pattern, namely every pair of vertex disjoint edges cross an even number of times. Um, apart from these characterizations, uh, we also have very fast, um, indeed even linear time algorithms to test planarity. Uh, let me just mention that um, the Hananitat theorem immediately gives, or well, it's maybe not immediately obvious, but rather trivially gives a polynomial time algorithm. It's not a uh, linear time one, but um, it's also very interesting uh, from that perspective, and that I'll also return to later on. Um, and so, as already as was already mentioned, um, one of the themes that I'm interested in is generalizing graph theoretic notions to higher dimensions. So, to motivate that, and this is maybe the only thing I have to say about connections to other sciences. Well, graphs are a ubiquitous combinatorial model all over science. Uh, to model pairwise interactions between objects. Uh, from a geometric point of view, they are also very simple one-dimensional spaces. And while simplicial complexes or hypergraphs are on the one hand higher dimensional spaces built from very simple building blocks, vertices, edges, triangles, tetrahedra, and higher dimensional simplices building, build, uh, glued together uh, along common faces. Um, and because of this combinatorial structure, they're also a very natural input model in computational topology when you want to represent shapes or spaces on a computer. But uh, for applications, one thing that is also very relevant is that they allow to model simultaneous interactions between three and more objects. And the classical example that pops up in convex geometry, but also in applications, say, uh, to the study of molecules are nerves or intersection patterns where here's just a simple example of disks in the plane, and you might want to make a difference between uh, three disks that intersect pairwise and three disks that have a common point of intersection. And you can model this just by putting either just the three edges of a triangle or a solid triangle or even a solid tetrahedron. Um, right, so the plan for today is to talk on the one hand about a very classical topic in geometric topology, namely embeddability of simplicial complexes in higher dimensional Euclidean spaces, which can be thought of as a high dimensional analog of planarity, but of course has also been studied from a topological point of view. Um, and there are two topics that I want to at least touch upon are classical obstructions and notions such as the Whitney trick on the van Kampen obstruction and I'll try to explain at least intuitively what these are. Um, and on the other hand, I want to focus on a 
more recent development, which studies the algorithmic point uh, question, how hard is it to decide uh, whether a given simple true complex embeds into a given target dimension? Um, is there any algorithm at all? If so, are there efficient algorithms? Um, a second topic that I want to mention, which maybe doesn't seem to be immediately related, but in my mind, it is almost the same, is the generalization of embeddings, where instead of forbidding any self-intersection, maybe you only want to forbid self-intersections of, of a particular type. For instance, you can imagine a two-dimensional shape in three dimensions. Maybe it's not embedded, but for instance, you can ask yourself, maybe you don't care about pairwise intersections. Maybe you really don't want to see triple intersections. Um, how about this? Can we take uh, classical results about embeddings and extend them to this setting? And this is in part motivated by classical problems at the intersection between convex geometry, discrete geometry, and topological combinatorics, in particular, the topological traffic conjecture. Um, in a sense, though, I should also stress that there are a vast number of topics that I'll simply not have time to talk about. Maybe the most outrageous omission is that I will not say anything about the classification of embeddings up to ambient isotopy. In other words, I will not say anything about knot theory. I'll not speak about graphs on other surfaces. Um, I won't even touch upon very interesting combinatorial questions about what one could call quantitative non-embeddability, meaning the study of crossing numbers and many other topics. Um, anyway, so I wasn't quite sure what background the audience would have. So let me start uh, to talk about higher dimensional embeddability with some very simple examples. So it's not quite formally correct, but one way of thinking about the two-dimensional simplicial complexes is uh, as some kind of Lego kit, or if you will, as some mathematical version of an IKEA furniture kit that you buy, and then you want to assemble it. Um, so you I think, for instance, of just a bunch of triangles plus some instructions how to glue them face to face. That's not quite formally a simplicial complex, but it's close enough. So here, for instance, is one example. We have these two triangles, and then the arrows indicate how they should be glued. And I want to know, can I do this in three-dimensional space? Now, my triangles are ideal triangles, so they're infinitely stretchable and bendable, but I just must not tear them. Now, in this simple example, it's easy to see that I can do this, because I just get a torus. By gluing just two of the triangles, say, along the triple arrow, I get a, I get a quadrilateral. Then gluing along the double arrow, I get a cylinder. And then, because the orientations match up, I can uh, close up this cylinder to get a torus. Uh, very nice. But uh, equal, an equally basic example is that if I just change the orientation of one identification, then I can't do this anymore because I still get a cylinder, but the identifications would force me because they reverse the orientation. They force a the self-intersection because I get a, I get a Klein bottle. Now, if my triangles fit together so nicely that they actually form an abstract surface, meaning at any edge, there are, more, there are exactly two triangles, and around every vertex, they close up to form a little disk, then I just have a surface, and then embeddability is simple just by the classification of compact surfaces. But uh, generally speaking, my, the complexes I'm interested in are much more complicated. So like, multiple triangles can meet at a common edge. The situation around the vertex can look much more complicated. Um, so let me give you sort of some very sketchy overview over what we know uh, about embeddability in higher dimensions, um, specifically from uh, an algorithmic loop one. So first of all, I should point out that in dimension, in ambient dimension three and higher, there is essentially no hope for a Kuratowski type criterion in terms of a finite list of forbidden subcomplexes or something of that sort. Um, of course, the way I say it now, it's very informal, so it can't really be counted as a mathematical theorem, but, but there are various ways of making this statement precise. So that is one other reason why, for instance, also sort of pure topologists are interested in the computational viewpoint of um, saying, well, if we maybe don't have a, such a nice combinatorial criterion, can we at least algorithmically decide embeddability? Um, 
I should start out by mentioning some classical facts about this. So apart from graph planarity, which we already saw, for which we have linear time algorithms, uh, one other classical result retains ambient dimension two, and this goes back to the 60s, to the work of Halley and Jung. And now the question is not can I map a graph in the plane, but can I map, can I embed a two-dimensional complex in the plane? And it turns out in this special case, because the ambient dimension is still two, there is a Kowatowski star criterion. So I have this finite list of forbidden substructures. So apart from K5 and K33, another thing, for instance, that you can't embed in the plane is the boundary of a tetrahedron, because you have to squash a sphere, or, for instance, three triangles meeting in a common edge, or a triangulated disk with a single edge sticking out, and so forth. And it turns out that this is the complete list, and uh, without too much work, by combining this list with Kuratowski's criterion and a little bit of additional work, this easily yields a linear time algorithm. But this is, uh, sort of, this is a very exceptional situation, essentially because we still are interested in embedding in the plane. So how about higher dimensions? Um, so when we started working on this, it was kind of surprising that even though this is such a natural and in a sense classical question, very little is known. Um, let me maybe, before I mention the only other thing classical thing that was not, let me, let me just mention a couple of trivialities. So the first triviality, but something that is very important to get used to, is that if the ambient dimension is high enough, then your simplicial complex embeds. So every graph embeds in R3, even with straight edges, simply by general position, because two, ed two lines generically don't intersect in R3. Likewise, every two-dimensional simplicial complex embeds in R5, even with straight triangles for the same reason, two planes don't intersect in R5, and so forth. So if the ambient dimension is two times the dimension of your complex plus one, embeddability, even geometric or straight embeddability without curvy simplices is not an issue. Um, on the other hand, this is sort of tight. So for every K, there exist K-dimensional complexes that do not embed into dimension two K. So higher dimensional generalizations, if you will, of K5 or K33. Indeed, in a very specific sense. And these were first constructed by Van Kampen and Flores in the 1930s. And, and so this regime where you have K-dimensional complexes and you ask whether they're embedded though, into dimension 2K, uh, this is the only regime where sort of something algorithmic was known. Um, and this goes back to the work of Van Kampen, Shapiro and Wu, and is sometimes called the Van Kampen obstruction or Van Kampen Shapiro Wu obstruction. Um, I will say a little bit uh, more about this later on, but for now let me just say that in the case where the ambient dimension is twice the dimension of what you want to embed, and this dimension is at least three, there's a complete obstruction. In fancy terms, it's something that lives in equivariant cohomology, but in concrete terms, it's just you, you, you give me your complex, I can write down a linear system of equations over the integers, I solve it, and if this the, the complex is embeddable in this regime of dimensions if and only if the system of equations has a solution which I can test, and if the parameter is k and therefore d are fixed, and this gives me a polynomial time algorithm. Um, okay, so how about other dimensions? Um, so, Originally, the, the first thing we really wanted to understand was dimension three, but that turned out to be, in a sense, the hardest, um, or at least the one that took us the longest to say anything about. Um, so let me first talk about the dimension, the, the case of large dimension, dimension at least four. And again, this will be very impressionistic. Um, maybe to the take away message without the concrete parameters, which always make this very hard to talk about, is they're sort of three, potentially only two, but at least at the moment, three interesting regimes. Sometimes the problem is simply algorithmically undecidable. Sometimes it's anti-hard, this we know, but in that regime we don't even know uh, whether there is any algorithm whatsoever. And in some other cases, uh, it's polynomial time. Um, and essentially, um, the, dis the, dis the distinguishing features are on the one hand the co-dimension, 
the difference be the, between the ambient dimension and the dimension of what you embed, want to embed. And on the other hand, sort of the ratio between the dimension and the dimension of what you embed. So on the one hand, if the co-dimension is very small, one or zero, and uh, the ambient dimension is at least five, the problem is undecidable. This follows from classical work of Novikov on the undecidability of the question whether a given five-dimensional manifold or high-dimensional manifold is the five-dimensional sphere. Um, and then there is this, so apart from this co-dimension one or zero regime, which is sort of very special, um, there's a question, is the dimension at least three over two times, the, is the ambient dimension at least three over two of what you want to embed or less? And this is the dividing line between polynomial time and being at least empty hard. Um, and again, I'll try to explain a bit where this comes from, at least sketchily. Um, and then uh, finally, the, the case ambient dimension three, which was for us at least the starting point and in a sense the most intuitive one. Uh, this was solved a, a few years ago. So in this case, we know that the problem is algorithmically decidable. Um, I should say that this uh, result builds heavily actually on earlier work in knot theory and, and three manifold topology in particular, unknot recognition and three sphere recognition. Um, I should also say that this is a very, very theoretical result. This algorithm is extremely impractical. The running time is worse than a tower of exponentials, but at least it's better than algorithmically undecidable. And um, there's some hope that this problem or the our algorithmic knowledge about it will behave maybe similarly to uh, unknot recognition or three-sphere recognition where the first algorithms were also completely and utterly impractical. And now we know that these are in P intersect co and P, uh, yeah, NP intersected co and P. And so, and, and we have algorithms that at least in some cases are reasonably practical and even implemented. But, and yeah, here I don't know, maybe Maybe this behaves similarly, maybe it's harder. At the moment, we don't know. Okay, so here's sort of the graphical picture, this sort of matrix, where we have uh, a dividing line, a dividing diagonal, where the ambient dimension is three times the dimension of what we want to embed. Okay, you cannot really see it here because the dividing line somehow goes like this and becomes interesting only in, in high dimensions. So this is the range where we know it's polynomial. Then there's this sort of magenta range where we really don't know what's going on. And then there's a thin range where we know the problem is undecidable. Okay. Any questions so far? Yeah, so the, the typical behavior is that, um, okay, it, it depends a little bit on you, how you measure, but it's, um, so what you, what you do is you, you have your simplicial complex in, in a fixed dimension, and then you set up an auxiliary um, space, the so-called deleted product, wh which is a cell complex who's not, where the number of cells is roughly quadratic in the number of cells of the original. And then it depends where exactly in this range you are. So here, so exactly at the boundary, you simply get one single uh, linear system of, equation, system of linear equations whose size is exactly the number of simplices in the deleted product, roughly. Uh, in general, what we know is that the sort of degree of the polynomial increases um, <coughs> with, the, with, the, with the dimension pretty badly. So also these, these so when, with, with these blue piece are here, um, as D or K grow larger, this becomes quickly uh, impractical. I don't know the exact degree, of, the ex exact dependence of the degree of the polynomial on on the dimension at the moment. And you get easier when you go up. Up in which sense? When you go from away from this magenta diagonal. Not necessarily. No. So there's a there's sort of a uniform bound that I mean in in every single dimension there's a uniform bound that applies to all of these. It it doesn't really get that much easier. Um, yeah. I mean, again, so these are these are sort of at the moment these are simply the only algorithms we know. It it could be that you can sort of fine tune and become better depending on where exactly in these regimes you are. Yes. Yeah, at some point, you, you, you have a, 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 a
Yes, we simply know that the problem is at least as hard as, say, solving three sets. So what we can do in, for instance, so one of these regimes is, um, oh, okay, this one. So the, the, the easiest example is if you want to embed a two-dimensional complex in four dimensions. We don't have any algorithm whatsoever to do this, but we do have, what we do have is an algorithm that, given a three-set formula or a three-colorability instance, constructs a two-dimensional complex with the property that the complex is embeddable in R4 if and only if the formula is satisfiable. So maybe algorithm can be any set of those Absolutely, yeah. Right, right, right. So we, that, that's, that's exactly what I mean. It's, it's a very weak hardness result, but it's the best we could do so far. Okay. Um, so what I would like to do next, ah, actually, um, so I wanted to give a very brief sketch of the structure of the algorithm for testing embeddability in three space, but in the interest of time, let me not go through this now. Um, and let me go to the next step because it's something that I consider in a sense, maybe, I mean, so, so the previous embeddability in R3 is special because of its low dim, of the low ambient dimension and it uses an entirely different set of techniques, three manifold topology and, and in particular normal surfaces, um, which is a beautiful set of tools, but maybe more special than uh, the idea I would like to talk about here, which is uh, deleted products or more generally uh, configuration spaces. Um, so let me talk about a, a very general necessary condition for the existence of an embedding. Okay, we have our simplicial complex K. We want to know whether it embeds in some ambient dimension D. Let's just look at an arbitrary map F from our complex into R to the D. Um, let's say K is a finite simplicial complex, so it's a compact space. So an embedding is the same thing as an injective continuous map. Let's look at the following natural configuration space. We look at the set of all pairs that are distinct. This is sometimes called the deleted product. So I look at all pairs x comma y. x and y are both elements of my simplicial points in my simplicial complex, and they're not the same. Now, if I have my given map, I can just look at the images of x and the, the image of y, and I can take the difference. Okay. Now, the first thing we note is that the zeros of this map correspond exactly to self-intersections or non-embedding points, singularities, if you will, of this map F. Uh, the second thing we can observe is that uh, there are natural symmetries acting here on the deleted product. You can simply swap factors. And on R to the D, you, have, you can simply take minus. Um, and this map is antipodal, so it respects these symmetries. If I exchange x and y, I simply change the sign. So therefore, in particular, oh yeah, here's, a, here's a little example. So if the only one I can really draw here, if k is just a line segment, then the product would be a square, but I remove the diagonal. Okay. Um, so what this gives immediately is that um, if I have an embedding, then I have an antipodal map without zeros. Uh, conversely, whenever I have something that I would call a generalized bosso gulam type theorem, I get a non-embeddability proof. So whenever I can prove by whatever techniques that there is no antipodal map from the deleted product of my complex into R to the D without zero, then I have proven that there is no embedding. The most classical example is, and, and um, uh, this is maybe the thing to keep in mind. The most classical theorem of a uh, version of such a theorem, no antipodal map without zero, is the bosse gulam theorem, which says that if I look at the d-dimensional sphere, well, there is no antipodal map from the d-dimensional sphere to r to the d without zero. And uh, whenever you can prove such a theorem with the sphere replaced by the deleted product of the space you're looking at, then you have proven non-embeddability. Um, now, you may ask, why is this useful or why is this interesting? Well, it sort of transforms the problem from one that is very geometric, a problem where you have to take care about self-intersections and how things sit inside ambient space, to one where you almost entirely forget about geometry, because this map, antipodal, this antipodal map, 
which you, whose existence you want to study, it has nothing to do with an embedding. It can heavily self-intersect and so forth. The only thing that matters is the symmetry of the underlying spaces. So, and, and this makes the problem much more accessible to methods of homotopy theory and other ideas from algebraic topology. Um, the amazing thing is that sometimes this necessary condition for embeddability is indeed sufficient. And, and this brings me back to the van Kampen obstruction that I mentioned earlier and its generalizations. So the most classical version of the theorem says that if you're in the special case where the dimension of the complex is half the ambient dimension, n at least three, then the existence of an antipodal map from the deleted product uh, to R to the D without zero is actually also sufficient and therefore equivalent to the existence of an embedding. And it turns out that this you can fairly easily capture and decide using cohomology theory. Uh, it turns out that there's a fairly far-reaching generalization of this to a broader range of dimension, namely when the dimension of K is roughly at most two-thirds of the ambient dimension. Uh, and, and this is sharp. If, if, this, if you're outside this range of dimension, then, then this equivalence doesn't hold anymore. And, and these are sort of the geometric or geometric topological facts that underlie all the cases in higher dimensions where we can decide embeddability. Okay, um, so what I would like to do is, I can't really, I don't really have time to prove this, but I would like to say at least a couple of words about the ideas that go in, because they're beautiful and they're also related to ideas in geometric graph theory, in particular the Hananitat theorem that we mentioned earlier. Um, so the first idea is that the existence of an antipodal map from the deleted product to R to the D without zero can, is actually equivalent to a condition that can be phrased in terms of maps from your simplicial complex to R to the D by just looking at intersection numbers. Um, okay, so I won't really have the time to explain why this is the case, but it's maybe one can at least sort of understand the statement. So first of all, what is the algebraic intersection number I'm talking about here? Let me explain it in terms of graphs in the plane first. So if you have a graph in the plane drawn in general position, then if you have two edges that don't share vertices, say, so you can look at their intersections. You can either just count the parity of the number of intersections between a pair of edges. That's what you do in the Hananitat style theorem. Or you can go a tiny step further and you can orient your edges which then allows you to look at intersection signs. So here, for instance, uh, the, these orientations are chosen arbitrarily. Once I've cho ori oriented the edges arbitrarily, then at each intersection point, locally, the orientations of the edges give me a local basis and therefore an orientation of the plane. And I can compare this orientation to one that I've chosen in advance. And I say the sign is plus. Um, if the orientation is positive and uh, minus otherwise. This depends on the orientation and on the order in which I consider the edges. Now it turns out that the same thing works in higher dimensions. If I have, um, let's say, a two-dimensional complex and I map it generically into four-dimensional space, then again, the two-dimensional simplices, just by counting dimensions, generically will intersect locally in isolated points. If I choose an orientation for each of my simplices, that's two basis vector for one simplex, two basis vectors for another one, I have four basis ve four vectors. In general position, they will form a basis. I compare this oriented basis with some fixed chosen orientation, I get a sign. And then the algebraic intersection number between two simplices is simply, I, I take, I go over all intersection points that they have, and I sum up the signs. So for instance, if I have these two edges, I see that the algebraic intersection number is zero because these numbers cancel out. Now, the signs that I've defined, they depend on the order and on choice, chosen orientations. But for instance, whether two, si two intersection points have opposite sign is invariant. So for instance, whether the algebraic intersection number is zero or not is independent of various choices that I've made. Okay, so now the question is, um, Given, okay, so I, I have this translation that says the symmetry preserving map exists if and only if there exists a map um, from my complex to R to the D in general position such that 
whenever I have a pair of vertex disjoint simplices, they have algebraic intersection number zero. Okay, so let's take this as a blackboard. Let's just look at this condition. How do I go about this? Or, or how is this proved? Or what's the intuition behind this? Well, the intuition is that you want to look at your favorite map to begin with. So you just map your simplicial complex into ambient space any which way you like. In the beginning, most likely you're not going to get an embedding, but then you imagine a continuous transformation, deformation of your embedding. And you observe, again, this is just, this is not now a formal argument that I'm giving, but, but this can be made precise, that, um, okay, let me start again with graphs in the plane. If you imagine that you've drawn your graph in the plane, and you ask yourself, when does this kind of condition, algebraic intersection number zero, change or not? A little bit of thought quickly reveals that the only time this algebraic intersection number changes is when I take one edge and I pull it over a vertex that is not one of its endpoints. Because then I change exactly the intersection number between this edge and all the edges that are incident to this vertex I'm pulling over by plus or minus one, depending on the chosen orientations. Any other edge that's not incident to this vertex, if I do this pulling sort of locally enough, I will intersect it once positively and once negatively. So more precisely, how do I do this pulling? I imagine that I take a tiny, tiny sphere, or in this case circle, centered around the vertex, and then I kind of connect this sphere to the original edge by this kind of tunnel that is so small that if there's any other edge, it will intersect it exactly once positively and once negatively. Um, now, what this says is that I have some kind of, I've reduced this question now to a very combinatorial question because I can exactly write down the possible sign changes that I can get in this way purely combinatorially. So I can, I can record the number of, all po for every pair of simplices or edges or simplices in higher dimensions of the right dimension, I can take my initial map, which gives me some vector of intersection numbers, which is an integer vector. If I take a linear starting map, it will be plus minus one zero vector. And then I ask, can I reduce this given vector to zero by these modifications, which is again a purely combinatorial notion. And that turns out it's, it's simply an, uh, an affine system of equations over the integers. Uh, that, that, that is then the question whether such a map exists with this property. This is of course not yet an embedding because I might have pairs of points, pairs of simplices that intersect where just algebraically everything cancels out but not yet geometrically. And then the next ingredient is the classical Whitney trick which says that if I have simplices of opposite dimensions in some ambient or complementary dimensions in some ambient space, and they intersect in a pair of points of opposite sign, uh, then I can cancel this pair out, provided the co-dimension is at least three. And, and again, I don't really have time to explain this, but maybe at least for a little bit of intuition. So first of all, the basic idea is clear already, maybe if you look at this picture, if this was in three-dimensional space, and this piece of a plane, of a curved plane, and this line intersect in this way, what you want to do to eliminate this intersection pair is you want to take the blue plane and push it upwards until you get rid of these two intersections. Okay, fair enough. Um, various difficulties. One is that if there's some other obstacle in the way, like this obstacle L here, then if I push the blue thing upwards, I might then get rid of the intersection between blue and red, but I will introduce intersections between blue and black. And the existence of such obstacles is exactly where the co-dimension restriction comes in. Um, if the co so first of all, what I can do is I can connect my two intersection points on the red simplex and on the blue simplex by paths. This gives me a little circle that is embedded by general dimension, uh, by general position. Um, now, this, I have an embedded circle in Euclidean space, so of course I can fill it with a disk, and if the dimension is sufficiently high, I can fill it with an embedded disk. This disk will not self-intersect. Moreover, 
if, so this disk is two dimensional. If the co-dimension is at least three, then this disk will not intersect any other part of my superficial complex. And then I can push the blue thing upwards along this disk to get rid of all intersections, avoiding all obstacles. Okay, this was extremely hand wavy, but it's meant to indicate where the co-dimension restriction comes from. Um, so maybe, you know, in terms of classical topology, these are maybe two ad three ideas to take home. The idea of deleted products, uh, the idea of algebraic intersection numbers, and the Whitney trick. Um, okay, so in the remaining um, 15 minutes, something like that? No, yeah, okay, about 15 minutes, I would like to switch gears and uh, from embeddings to higher, higher multiplicity intersections, hmm. triple, quadruple, and so forth. And uh, this is motivated by um, a problem in discrete or convex geometry. Uh, and initially, a theorem in convex geometry that was proved by Tverberg in the 1960s. Um, so actually, on this slide, I should have put an even earlier result, which is Radon's lemma, which says that, well, if you have, for instance, four points in general position in the plane, then either they form a triangle and one point in the interior, or they are in convex position, in which case you have two diagonals that cross. In either case, you can partition your four points into two parts whose convex hulls intersect. The same if you have d plus two points in R to the d, you can partition them into two parts whose convex hulls intersect. This is sort of closely related to embeddability or non-embeddability. Uh, Tverbeck's theorem is a generalization if you don't want two parts, but three, four, five, what have you, many parts that intersect. It says that if you fix your favorite multiplicity R and your ambient dimension D, if you take sufficiently many points, namely D plus one times R, many, R minus one plus one many points, then any set of points with this many points has an R-fold intersecting partition, meaning you can partition it into R disjoint parts whose convex hulls intersect. Here's a tiny example with the intervention tool with three parts. And then let's see, so D is two plus one is three, R is three, so this is three times two is six plus one is seven. So we have seven points in the plane and proof by example, indeed we can partition these particular seven points into three parts whose convex hulls intersect. Okay, now one question that is sort of a recurrent theme in, in discrete geometry to some extent, um, actually pops up in many other uh, situations such as Helly's theorem as well, is to what extent are the theorems that we are proving really properties of linearity or convexity, or and to what extent are they actually just manifestations of topological properties such as, well, a convex set is contractible or something like this. Um, so in other words, what happens if we draw our triangles and edges in a curvy manner, like here? Can we still always find a partition or not? Okay, so to make this more precise, uh, this is something, a question or conjecture that was uh, formulated by Imre Baren in the 70s and has since become known as the topological Tverbeck conjecture which says that, well, take the same parameters, multiplicity r, uh, dimension d, n, d plus one times r minus one, and now look at the n-dimensional simplex, which has n plus one vertices, and consider a continuous map from this simplex to r to the d. And the conjecture says that you have an r-fold intersection, meaning you will find r vertex disjoint faces of your simplex, whose images intersect. Now, if your map is a linear or affine map, then that's exactly a reformulation of Tverbeck's theorem because this simplex has n plus one vertices. A linear map is described simply by describing the images of these vertices, which is a point set. And then the images of the faces are simply convex hulls of the corresponding vertex sets. And uh, yeah, the question is, does an analog of Tverbeck's theorem hold in this much more general topological uh, setting where we want to have double intersections. Here would be an example of it. Three simplices, three two-dimensional simplices in R3, 
forming a triple intersection uh, with higher multiplicities, it becomes harder to draw pictures. Um, now this, this question became somewhat something like a cornerstone of topological combinatorics. Uh, first of all, it was verified in increasing generality in more and more cases. First for r equal to two, this is a topological generalization of Radon Plema. Then for prime multiplicities by Baran, Kosman, and Such. And uh, somewhat later for all multiplicities that are prime powers. And um, there are also multiple variants, um, modifications of this theorem where typically instead of the simplex, you take some other simplicial complex that has some interesting structure. Um, and you want to know similarly, does every continuous map from this other complex into R to the E have an R fold intersection or not? You can think of this as a generalized non embeddability statement. In some sense, this conjecture is like a conjectural generalization of the fact that K5 is not planar. That, that's one way of thinking about it, which may or may not be useful. Um, the cases that were verified were verified using ideas very closely related to the deleted product idea that I mentioned earlier. So earlier we looked at the deleted product where we took two factors, you know, two copies of our complex, and then we remove the suitable diagonal. And then we said, if we have an embedding, then we get a symmetry preserving map to sub Euclidean space without zero. And this can be generalized by looking at um, more complicated deleted products where the number of factors is the multiplicity that you're interested in. Uh, the diagonal becomes a little bit more complicated. The Euclidean space becomes a little bit more complicated. but. And, and also the symmetry group becomes more complicated. In just permuting two factors, you can arbitrarily permute the factors. So the symmetry group will be the full symmetric group. And the sort of bosuk ulam time statement that people look at is, does there exist a completely symmetry-preserving map from this deleted product into the appropriate Euclidean space? And uh, it turns out that this map exists if and only if the multiplicity is uh, not a prime power. So if the multiplicity is a prime power, then the map does not exist. And then this deleted product criterion shows that there doesn't exist a generalized embedding, a map without r fold intersection, conjecture proved in that case. But if r is not a prime power, then this deleted product criterion fails. The symmetry preserving map does exist. OK, and that's kind of why the question stood at that point for so long because it wasn't clear, I think, in the topological combinatorics community what next to do. Um, so motivated by these classical results about embeddings, we were wondering uh, what about, could it be that, that this deleted product criterion is actually sufficient, not only necessary, at least in a certain range of dimension, and that this could be uh, used to prove counterexamples? And uh, so we wonder, is there sort of some analog of the of this sort of general theory of embeddings to general theory of maps without r fold intersections? And it turns out there is, at least uh, in some cases, again, under some dimension or co-dimension restrictions. So here's a theorem that we could prove together with Isaac Maria, um, which is a direct generalization of the Van Kampen Shapiro Wu theorem, which concerns what I would call the critical case. Again, the parameters are difficult to parse, but think of the case where the dimension of your complex is such that if you map it into Euclidean space, you expect to see a, a zero-dimensional set of R-fold intersections. So for instance, if you have a two-dimensional complex and you map it into R3, three planes in R3 intersect generically in a single point. So that's one example. Another example would be if you have a 15-dimensional complex and you map it to R18. Okay, let's parse this. So 15 in RT, R18, that means co-dimension three. If you look at intersections, the co-dimensions add up. Well, 18 is six times three. So if you take six 15-dimensional simplices or, or affine subspaces in R18, then generically they intersect in a single point. So that's another instance. And what we could prove is that in this specific uh, regime of dimensions, 
assuming also that the co-dimension is at least three, like in the 15 to 18 example that I just mentioned, a map without R-fold intersection exists if and only if you have the appropriate symmetry preserving map without zeros. Um, what you get as a immediate corollary is that in this regime, if additionally R is not a prime power, then for any complex of that dimension, there exists uh, an R -fold, a map without R-fold intersection. So that's a higher multiplicity analog of saying that not only K5 is planar, but K6 is planar, K7 is planar, K1 million is planar. Of course, it's nonsense, but in higher, there's higher non-prime power multiplicities. An analogous statement is true. It doesn't matter how large you make your 15-dimensional complex. You can always map it into R18 without a six-fold intersection. Uh, so this was somewhat surprising. And, and this is a direct corollary of our result combined with a uh, result about the existence of symmetry-preserving maps. And uh, yeah, this also yields counterexamples to certain variants of the, uh, of the topological Klaver conjecture and, and answers a question that had also been asked in a different context. But it doesn't answer the topological Klaver conjecture because for the topological Klaver conjecture, we look at a complex that is a high dimensional simplex. So this co-dimension assumption is not satisfied. And uh, miraculously, there is a, an astonishingly elegant and simple way around it, which uh, was first observed by Flick uh, in 2015, uh, which is based on the fact that the situation for the full simplex can be reduced to uh, a lower dimensional skeleton by a simple lifting uh, that was uh, proved by Gromov and by Blagojevich Bigziger. So I don't have really time to explain this, but let me just okay state it. So, what we can okay, what we can prove is that there exists a map from say a fi any 15-dimensional complex. For instance, the 15-dimensional uh, skeleton of the 100-dimensional uh, simplex, which just means you take 101 vertices and you take all simplices up to dimension 15 uh, that is are spanned by these vertices. So this thing you can map into R18 without six-fold intersection. And now given any such map, there's a beautiful and simple to describe lifting uh, of where you can map the whole simplex, not only this lower dimensional skeleton, but the whole thing into just one dimension higher. And by a pigeonholing argument, you can avoid six-fold intersections also among higher dimensional simplices. Okay, I don't have time to explain this, but this is essentially, this has a, a three-line proof, which is ingenious, but uh, let me not go there. And, and this holds more general for, you know, whenever the parameters make sense. Um, now what this gives is then counterexamples to the original conjecture whenever the ambient dimension is three times R, R is not a prime power, and ambient dimension three times R plus one, where the, so R is not a prime power that comes from residing three times R that comes from our co-dimension restriction, and plus one comes from this lifting. So for instance, this way you get the smallest counterexample is a map from the 100-dimensional simplex to R19. I hope I didn't make a mistake here. Um, well, you can correct me if this doesn't work out in terms of the numbers, without six-fold intersection. Um, it, a little later, we found a slightly different way that doesn't quite do the lifting and that gets rid of this plus one by a restricted class of maps that we call prismatic. This gives counterexamples in dimension 3R. So let's say a map from the 95 dimensional simplex to now R18 without six fold intersection. And uh, later on, we managed to improve the co dimension restriction from 3 to 2, which further reduces this. But um, all of these are still very high dimensional situations. And we don't really understand what happens uh, in lower dimensions. OK. Um, so let me just, I, I will not have much time to say more. Um, so I hope you're all still more or less awake, apart from those of you who aren't. So the, the idea of the pr proof is essentially to mimic exactly the same structure that we've seen earlier for the proof that of the Van Kampen obstruction 
that the existence of a symmetry preserving map is equivalent to the existence of embedding. So here we do something similar in the right range of, of uh, dimensions. Um, the first thing is that one can observe using similar ideas as before, generalizations of finger moves, that the existence of a symmetry preserving map is equivalent to the existence of a general position map of the original complex into R to the D, such that now not pairwise algebraic intersection numbers, but threefold, fourfold, and generally R-fold algebraic intersection numbers are zero whenever you have an R-tuple of vertex disjoint simplices. And there's an appropriate generalization of algebraic intersection number to higher multiplicities. Now, once you have that, what you need is a higher multiplicity analog of the Whitney trick, where you have now not two simplices that intersect in a pair of points of opposite sign, but you have three or four or six simplices that intersect in a pair of sixfold, let's say, intersection sign. Uh, intersection points of opposite sign. And so let me just sort of sketch it for the case of multiplicity three. Um, so here are three disks in three space. Okay, I don't know whether you can really see them. So here's, let's say it's a local picture. So everything takes place inside a three dimensional wall. Here's one disk, the blue disk. Here's another disk, this green disk, which intersects the blue disks it's a bit curved and intersects the blue disks in these two, two segments. And then there is a red disk which sits like a sausage, like a curvy sausage in the back of our big gray ambient ball, intersects the blue disks also in these two red curves, and these two red curves intersect the two green curves. And okay, I didn't give the exact definition of signs, but these, opposition, uh, these intersection signs are opposite. And now we want to eliminate this, uh, this pair of intersection points. How do we do this? Okay, so I'm running out of time. So here's simply sort of a very sketchy low-tech movie. I wish I had an animation of this, but um, so the idea is to proceed by induction on the dimension and first look at the situation that you see when you intersect everything with a fixed disk, say the blue one. So there you see this pattern. So that's almost like the classical Whitney trick because the blue thing is now our ambient space and we have two objects, red and green, that intersect with opposite sign. So we want to apply the Whitney trick, but we can't because the red thing is disconnected and the green thing is disconnected. So it's actually no canonical notion of opposite intersection signs. Everything sort of depends on the ambient structure that we have forgotten by restricting. But the good thing is that we can get rid of this by making the intersections connected, by growing these little tubes from one piece to the other. So here is sort of an indication of how you would do this in the intersection. The important thing is that you can also do this ambiently. So for instance, if I want to make the intersection of the green thing with the blue thing connected, I can uh, put in this little cylinder that connects these, this part of the green, this sort of sheet over here, and this one. And then I get exactly the kind of intersections that I want with the blue one, which are connected. So then I can actually talk about, okay, sorry. In the picture, the intersections are still disconnected, but that's an artifact of the very low dimensions. Uh, in higher dimensions, they would actually be connected. But anyway, so even here, there at least the intersection points are in the same connected components, so it still makes sense. Okay, now you do this for the green part, but what, what have you done? You have done something terrible because you have changed the topology of the green object. It's no longer a disk. It's a disk with a handle, which is not something you really want to talk about. Um, but you can repair this um, by, so this can be thought of as a, as a, I always get confused with the indices, but a, let's say it's a zero dimensional surgery on the disk and there's a complementary surgery that repairs the topology. So intuitively speaking, if I connect, if I put in this green tunnel, I can imitate this by, so this, uh, this is something that I insert along a little path here and I can repair this by a complementary surgery, which in this case just means that I take the top here and I push it downwards until I reach. Um, here's a side view. Okay, I don't know if this makes much sense. There's sort of a general principle here, which is, which is a geometric or ambient surgery, uh, which allows you to get the intersection pattern with the blue object that you want and still retain the property that what you have, the green thing, 
is a disk. So you do this for the green object. You do this also for the red object. I'm not showing it. Now the intersections with the blue thing are connected. It makes sense to talk about having the same signs. Now inductively by the induction on the dimension, we can, we are, we are sort of in a lower dimension and also the multiplicity is lower. Instead of triple points, we look at double points within the blue thing. By the lower multiplicity with trick, we can remove it by a geometric modification inside the blue thing. Um, and then it turns out that we can actually uh, imitate this also globally. So, okay, I should have put this. So here, this is the sort of thing we had. We had this sort of slight, um, I don't know, canyon or whatever, or slight push that you do to create this little indentation here in the green thing. And then uh, later on, what you can do is you can sort of push these things apart to change the intersection with the blue thing accordingly. Okay. Um, this was meant to sort of convey a little bit of uh, maybe not intuition, but uh, flavor of what's going on. Okay, um, let me stop here with the sort of formal statements and let me just conclude with some uh, questions. Um, so the first one is that we absolutely don't know what happens for the embeddability problem, even the classical one, for its algorithmic decidability outside this sometimes called metastable range. So what happens when the dimension of the complex is larger than two-thirds times the ambient dimension? So then we know it's at least MP-hard, but we don't know if there's any algorithm whatsoever. Um, there might be some hope, even in this range, to make some progress, assuming still that the co-dimension is at least three. There are extensions of the classical results by uh, Van Kampen and by Hefliger and Weber to that gives some kind of mathematical handle on how to deal with embeddings or embeddability, which goes under the keyword of calculus of embeddings or calculus of functors due to good really Klein and Weiss. Um, but at the moment, it's entirely unclear if this can be made algorithmic. Um, yeah, as I mentioned before, embeddability in three space may be the most intuitive question. We know it's algorithmically decidable. We have no idea about the computational complexity. Is it hard? Is it, does it behave similarly to unknotting or sphere recognition? We don't know. Um, a rather different question is how about what happens when we don't only want to decide whether something embeds, but we actually want to get our hands on an embedding, which is a, a priori rather different question. So in, in three dimensions, the algorithm, albeit very complicated, in principle it's constructive, and in principle sort of constructs an embedding. The higher dimensional uh, results that we had earlier, where we have a polynomial time algorithm to decide embeddability, um, it doesn't give us an embedding by a long shot. Um, yeah, sort of regarding the second topic, multiple intersections, one question is can we do better with the co-dimensions? Can we this way further lower the dimensions? Another case, a sort of different direction, is how about the planar case? So this is sort of the, the by now maybe, the, the biggest open problem. A priori, the topological Trebek conjecture for non-prime powers could be false even for the plane. How would we even approach to do this? So one question is, if there is some hanani tat type theorem for R-fold intersections, um, and we don't know. And... Maybe a more philosophical question is, are there other, what one could call, after the home of H principles and topological combinatorics? So what we have seen here is sort of this pattern that under certain restrictions, there's some natural necessary criterion often for typically formulated in this example in terms of some natural configuration space and the existence of some symmetry preserving map. Um, We've seen this now for embeddings and for maps without triple and higher multiplicity intersections. There are many other instances in topological combinatorics, mass partition problems, coloring problems, where geometric or combinatorial statements are proved by translating them into this setting. And um, there are also other instances, in particular, say, equipartition problems for measures, where it's known that the corresponding symmetry preserving map exists if and only if and then some number theoretic condition often, if and only if some important parameter is not a prime power. And the question is, can we in those instances 
similarly somehow find geometric arguments to get from the existence of such an equivariant map to a true geometric solution. Okay, so I'll stop here. And thank you very much for your time.